Okay, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Uh, today is March 12th, uh, 2022, and I'm Bob Flax, the Executive Director. Um, and I also just want to point out we have a new staff member um, on the call, uh, Dre uh, Andrea Klein Bergman, who prefers to be called Drea. So if you just wave for a moment. Um, so she is our Director of Programs and Campaigns. Uh, so this program, the book club, comes under her department, uh, and you'll probably be hearing from her about other programs in the future. Oh, I should say, yes, uh, Byron's been with us for a while, but let me point out uh, that Byron Belitsos is our other department manager uh, of development and marketing. Uh, Byron, if you would uh, just identify yourself. So we have actually uh, our two main departments are represented here today. Um, so um, yes, and they, they are the people, you know, I may be the front man, but they are the people behind the scenes that make everything happen. So we'll, um, so this is our third session of Reading the Politics of World Federation by Joseph Barada. And we are once again pleased to have Joseph with us and joining us to discuss chapters eight and 16. Uh, Joseph and I spoke a little bit before the call and we imagine that there'll be a lot of questions and comments about what's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, so he, he would ask, and we both asked that um, when we get to the questions portion, um, that we ask, we, we ask our questions first about the chapters. And then when we've gotten through that, we'll open the floor um, to questions and comments about the situation in the Ukraine. So then uh, I'll remind people when we get to that point. So we'll proceed as usual with Joseph pointing out what he feels are the highlights and main takeaways of those chapters. And then we'll uh, open it up for questions and discussion. Um, we ask everybody to go on mute at this time and please remain on mute when you're not speaking so we don't hear the phones ringing and the dogs barking and all of that wonderful stuff in the background. And again, you're welcome to use the chat feature uh, in Zoom to communicate with each other, but we won't be monitoring it uh, for you know, to, to bring questions to Joseph or whatever. So, but you could certainly use it to communicate amongst yourselves. When we do get to the question portion, we'll just ask you to raise your hand. Um, we'll stop at about 10 minutes before the end of the session in case anyone has any announcements or events they wanna promote or anything of that sort. So we ask you to hold all of those comments until then. And Last but not least, um, if folks arrive into the, uh, the, the Zoom chat here um, and that we don't know who they are, I may stop the proceeds um, just to the, have them identify themselves so we don't have any Zoom bombers, as they call it, who will hack in and disrupt everything. If something should happen and the system goes down for that reason or any other, we just ask people to um, shut down, come back in about five minutes, and we'll just pick up from there. Uh, luckily, that has not happened yet in our, you know, two plus years of doing this. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Joseph. Well, greetings, everybody. Now, as uh, Bob mentioned, um, I would like, I know that the war in Ukraine is on everybody's mind, but I would like to postpone questions about current events until questions about the two chapters in my book have been entertained. Uh, please bear in mind that these chapters were designed to provide historical analogy to efforts like ours today to meet the threat of war. The World Federalists in the 1940s were trying to head off the very war that we fear has come to us. These two chapters tell the stories of two leaders who acted immediately after use of atomic bombs in war, Grenville Clark and Henry Usborne. Grenville Clark was a Wall Street lawyer with US government experience. He became the elder statesman of the main, mainstream minimalist American group, United World Federalists. Henry Usborne was a Birmingham industrialist, a socialist, elected to the British Parliament in the Labour Party in the landslide of 1945. He launched the international movement that resulted in creation of the World Movement for World Federal Government 
and its spin-off, the European Union of Federalists. The first is now called the World Federalist Movement, and the second, the Union of European Federalists. The latter has been particularly devoted to the European Union, the most successful achievement of Federalist dreams. I am going to skip the chapter on the formation of United World Federalists because they were so slow to unite that when they did in February 1947, President Truman of the United States soon announced the, the containment policy, replacing the wartime policy of the United Nations. The five groups that made up United World Federalists wasted all of 1946 in rival bickering, particularly the elite Americans United for World Government and the more grassroots World Federalists until they had wasted all that was left of the historical opportunity to begin to establish a World Federation. The Chicago group under Robert M. Hutchins formed as early as the first week after Hiroshima, but it took so long for busy academics to produce their draft world constitution that it did not appear until March, 1948, a month after the Communist Party coup in Czechoslovakia. Most people took the, the coup as final proof of Stalin's aggressive intentions. It led directly to the North Atlantic Treaty in 1949. The Cold War was on. Clark and Osborne did not make that mistake of delay. They are significant for their vision and timeliness. I hope you have read closely and entered imaginatively into the courageous and visionary actions that Clark took. He was responding not just to the atomic bomb, but to the Second World War itself. He wrote a first draft of a government to keep the peace by the rule of law in 1939 shortly after seeing Clarence Streit's book, Union Now. He was the principal author of the Selective Service Act of 1940, when President Roosevelt could not act for fear that the isolationists would charge him, as did Senator Burton Wheeler, with plowing every fourth American boy under. During the war, Clark served in Henry Stimson's War Department but by D-Day, it was evident that the age when nations could defend themselves by preparing for war was nearing an end. Stimson told Clark after the Normandy land landings, what you should do is go home and figure out a way to prevent future wars. Think of what war will become. It is intolerable. Hiroshima only hurried Clark's efforts he brought Strite to a conference near his home in Dublin, New Hampshire. He persuaded Supreme Court Justice Owen Roberts, who had resigned from the court to work on Strite's union, work politically on Strite's union of democracies to come. He brought together a most prestigious group of internationalists, journalists, scientists, lawyers, and veterans to devise some reforms of the new UN, new United Nations organization to make it adequate to the new atomic bombs. One of them was Henry DeWolf Smythe, author of an official report on the construction of the new weapon. Emery Reeves, uh, author of uh, the um, uh, Anatomy of Peace came, as did Norman Cousins, of the uh, Saturday Review, Thomas Finletter, who later would make the United World Federalists, Thomas Mahoney, a Massachusetts lawyer, and Louis B. Sona, Harvard internationalist, Tom Griesemer, a leader of the World Federalists, and Edgar An Ansel Maurer, a prominent journalist, and Cord Meyer Jr., uh, a veteran. At Dublin, there was a critical debate between the Stritists and the World Federalists. 
You can watch the eight clauses of the Dublin Declaration shape up, especially after Clark made a powerful speech to reconcile the two groups. He suggested a majority and a minority report, not a compromise that would be so vaguely worded as to mean nothing at all, like some diplomatic agreements. I'd like to read the first three clauses on page 149 and the preamble. Uh, later, I'm going to claim that um, these uh, manifestos or these declarations of principles are the uh, most significant survival of the World Federalist Movement. So it's important that we hear them. First, that the implications of the atomic bomb are appalling. That upon the basis of evidence before this conference, there is no presently known adequate defense against the bomb and that there is no time to lose in creating effective international institutions to prevent war by exclusive control of the bomb and other major weapons. Second, that the United Nations Charter, despite the hopes millions of people placed in it, is inadequate and beyond the behind the times as a means to promote peace and world order. Third, that in place of the present United Nations organization, there must be substituted a world federal government with limited but definite and adequate powers to prevent war, including power to control the atomic bomb and other major weapons and to maintain world inspection and police forces. And then I'd like to read the preamble, uh, which shows Clark's hand um, on page, which is on page 150, 51. It is almost axiomatic that there can be no peace without order and no order without law. There could be no world peace until there is a world order based upon principles of the limitation and the pooling of national external sovereignty by all nations for the common good of mankind. The only effective means to create such a world order is to establish a world government. Since the moral law applies to nations as well as to men, and since justice dictates the necessity of seeking the greatest good for the greatest number, such a world government must be a world federal government, providing a minimum of centralized control and a maximum of self-government in the separate nations. Then came Clark's dissemination to officials and the public of the declaration, which I've just read. In short, he was offering a minimal and official plan. He was so rich, he once said that he had done well by the law, that in the days before Xerox machines, he had the declaration and a background report typeset and thus reproduced by the thousands. Local newspapers like the Manchester Union reported positively on the declaration. But national papers like the New York Times and the New York Herald Tribune were critical of utopianism and scrapping the United Nations at the very moment of its birth. I'd like to read one of those statements from the Times. A true world federation, such as the Clark Group contemplates, is beyond attainment at this stage of history. If the Dublin conferees doubt this assertion, let them read the day's news 
or put a question to London or Moscow, not to mention Washington. The actual choice is not between the UNO and an ideal world government. It is between UNO and chaos. As a result, Clark tended to avoid the expression of world government and instead all his remaining life preferred to speak of UN reform. Nevertheless, the fundamental criticism of a league of sovereign states, not a federal government of peoples ruling by law reaching to individuals survived. Now to turn to Henry Osborne. Immediately after first use of atomic bombs in the war, there was surprising flexibility in governments about how to deal with the new threat to the peace. Winston Churchill, though out of office, continued to exercise leadership on historic events. He urged Franco-German reconciliation within a year and helped create the Council of Europe in 1949. The foreign minister, Ernst Bevan, was even more daring. In the parliamentary debate on the United Nations in the atomic age, he said on 23 November, 1945, I am willing to sit with anyone of any nation to try to devise a franchise or a constitution, just as other great countries have done for a world assembly. As the right honorable gentleman, Winston Churchill said, with a limited objective, the objective of peace. The two leaders within a few years found themselves at odds about not world federation, but two visions of European integration. Western Union, which became NATO, including the USA, or European Union, which became the European Council and the European Coal and Steel Community. But Henry Osborne picked up on Bevan's initiative. He was so disappointed that the foreign minister did not follow up his talk of a world assembly with the split between East and West evident at the Moscow conference in December, 1945, and with the inadequacy of the United Nations crippled by the veto, that he concluded that the governments would not do what was necessary to secure the peace. What was needed was a direct appeal to the peoples of the world. He began circulating among MPs a draft resolution of a world appeal. He drew 40 co-sponsors by March 1946 and 70 by October when he published a radical little pamphlet for an unofficial People's World Constitutional Convention entitled, If They Won't, We Will. In short, he was making a revolutionary proposal and an unofficial approach outside governments to the peoples of the world. There was still enough flexibility about British foreign policy that Usborne himself, a vice president of Britain's Federal Union, analogous to Streit's organization of the same name in America, and now a parliamentary advocate of World Federation, was used by the Labour Party in November 1946 to move the acceptance of the King's annual speech from the throne, the traditional way for the party to sound out public opinion about new departures in policy. The public was not ready for federal union, but was quite distracted by the two visions of Mevin and Churchill the one for what became the North Atlantic Treaty and the other for the Council of Europe. Excuse me, that's my phone. I just have to ignore it. So Osborne proceeded alone with his revolutionary project to go around governments directly to the people. It took 14 months from Bevan's speech on world law, a fateful delay, if unavoidable, during which the Cold War rapidly developed. By January 1947, his plan, known as the Crusade in Outline, had drawn some 72 co-sponsors. In another year, by 1948, over 100 were associated, including Sir William Beveridge, Bertrand Russell, and Sir John Boyd Oyer. 
These numbers were comparable to those in the United States Congress during debates on World Federation in 1948 and 49. A chapter 16 of my book recounts how Osborne actually proceeded on an international stage. There was a preliminary conference of representatives from 14 countries in Luxembourg in October, 1946. But all it could accomplish was to plan a bigger, more formal conference at Montreux, Switzerland in August, 1947, another fate, fateful delay. But Montreux did produce what become, did produce what became the World Federalist Movement and the Union of European Federalists dedicated more narrowly to European Union. There were deep problems for this international project. One, lack of ideological preparation in the world population. Two, lack of prestigious leadership and three, lack of money. Tom Griesemer and the organizers estimated that they would need $40,000 for the first year. After four months, they had raised only a quarter of that. The president, French sociologist Jean Lamarou, found a small office in Paris, but there was only one paid full-time employee, Henri Coach, head of the propaganda department. He distributed 15,000 copies of the Montreux Declaration in French and English. Osborne immediately tried to spread the word. He traveled all through October 1947 on a continental tour of the United States, trying to arrange elections of representatives to his People's World Constitutional Convention, now scheduled for Geneva in December 1950. While on this tour, he met the wealthy American heiress, Anita McCormick Blaine, who gave hints of an intention to donate $1 million to one of the World Federalist organizations. What happened to the $1 million, I will leave for another time. Osborne traveled in Britain, France, Luxembourg, and Scandinavia, trying to arrange elections. He often spoke on the radio. Edward T. Clark, American treasurer of the little group, carried the word to Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Egypt, India, and Japan. In India, two months after Gandhi's death, Clark had a substantial interview with Jawaharlal Nehru, who came out publicly thereafter in favor of world government. Later, Forced by the reality of East-West conflict, Nehru undertook leadership in the non-aligned movement of the Cold War. Well, that's a brief recapitulation of those two chapters, folks. I, um, I, um, what's, what's noticeable is that they use this uh, crisis over the atomic bomb uh, <clears throat> to work for not just uh, some limitation of, of uh, uh, nuclear power, but uh, on a fundamental restructuring of the United Nations. And that, that seems to me relevant to your, your situation now. So uh, uh, with that, I would like now to entertain questions from any of the audience. Great, Th thank you, Joseph. So I'll invite people to um, raise their cyber hand because that automatically puts you in order so we know how to go. Uh, I, I have been told though that some iPads and some other things may not have that feature. So after we clear the cyber hands, um, I'll see if anybody needs to uh, raise their flesh hand and, and we'll take it from there. Also again, I in, in, urge everyone to keep their questions relatively short uh, so that we can get everyone in. Um, if you were with us the last couple of, of sessions, you know we went overtime in each session. So uh, I want to make sure we get everybody in. So starting off with Ted and then on to Gail. Go ahead, Ted. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Uh, hello, Professor Baraja. Um, once again, it's great to hear your uh, immense level of erudition about this 
particular history that is so unknown in the world today. Um, Joseph, you know, and I think a, a few other people here know that I uh, worked for uh, the late U.S. Senator Alan Cranston uh, toward the end of his life. And uh, as you know, his, his lifespan was 1914 to 2000. He was a U.S. Senator from 69 to 93, but he was very much one of our founders, uh, very active uh, at, in 1947 at uh, Asheville, and then of course served as our second president. Um, he and I talked quite a bit about those days, um, as you might imagine. But one thing he told me, which uh, I wish I could interrogate him more about, is he told me that Grenville Clark was his number one mentor, uh, clearly the person who, who guided him and inspired him and educated him about the idea of democratic federal world government. And I guess I don't, that's all I know about it. I don't really know anything else about their relationship. Clark was of course about a generation older, maybe 25 or 30 years older. So that's my question. Do you know anything about the relationship between 30 something Alan Cranston and 60 year old or so uh, Grenville Clark? during those days. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Ted. Um, uh, before I respond, I, I'd like to just to remind you that I sent you a, a response to your question about young people. And uh, I wonder if that's gotten into your junk mail because I've not heard back. I'd like to hear back from you, please. Now- um, Will do, thank sorry, but yes, I know I owe you an email on that. Uh, thank you for the stimulating reply. So thank you. Um, well, young people are really a, quite a serious um, matter on this. Uh, they don't, we don't seem to have a, enough young people. Um, now, Cranston was the um, second vice president of United World Federalists, and both uh, he and uh, Cord Meyer were veterans uh, present at the Dublin conference. Uh, organized by Clark, Gren Grenville Clark. Um, and um, uh, 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 later, uh, in, by 1950, after the Korean War broke out, why um, uh, United World Federals greatly feared that uh, they would be uh, targeted by Senator McCarthy uh, for uh, <clears throat> For, for treason, and they actually prepared um, a legal um, defense in anticipation of this attack, and Cranston uh, was um, president by that moment. Uh, uh, Meyer had uh, uh, withdrawn from the presidency, and uh, as some of you may know, he joined the CIA in 1950, which uh, people feel is a uh, a great betrayal, but uh, the truth is that uh, most other leaders uh, simply uh, uh, tried to hide, <clears throat> lay low, and um, avoid uh, 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 attacks. But the uh, the uh, the attacks from the McCarthyites never came, and so all these preparations made by Cranston. Cranston also uh, kept mum about his involvement in the movement. Um, so um, Cranston then became, I would say, uh, uh, a rather creative and uh, dissenting uh, senator uh, during the Vietnam War, particularly. I've always admired him. Um, my folks uh, retired to Los Angeles and Cranston was their senator. <laughs> For some reason he aged quickly and they, uh, my folks were so afraid that he looked so old. I, th I think that was because he crammed so much life into into his life, and um, he did what he could. You know, you couldn't fight for World Federation after 1950, not publicly, and this has been true to this day. But he was a, a good man, like some others. Next, please. Okay, thank you, Joseph. So, uh, Gail, you're up next. You have to unmute. Um, I know this is just, uh, I'm thinking that David Gallup might give us some uh, comment about this. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Sarazek Sulej later became the manager of Gary Davis. 
He was excitable. I'm wondering if if uh, David knew of him or whatever. But that that's not my question to Joseph. My question is, the plan and outline was referred to, and I'm wondering what that is. And kind of connected with that is, um, there, it was stated there there's need to be to have an ideological foundation um, for world government, and I'm wondering whether the six principles that were stated uh, would constitute that in part at least. And um, that leads into a question of, you know, that we should think about is, do we have an ideological foundation? Anyway, those are my <laughs> interconnected questions. The six principles, you mean of the Dublin Declaration? Right. Uh, well, Gail, um, later, uh, the last, uh, our last meeting is the, in June, well, I, I'm distributing uh, uh, the appendix, which uh, prints all these uh, declarations. I think those are the ideological foundations of our movement. Um, it's helpful to have a history but um, the very the very principles um, that uh, the way it's summed up is there's no peace without law, no peace without justice, no justice without law, and no law without government. This is a fundamental principle. Uh, and what the Federalists, there's an expression for the, <clears throat> what the Federalists uh, wanted can be expressed in a very short principle. They argued that there could be no peace uh, maintained by an organization of sovereign states like the United Nations because it requires only voluntary compliance by the states. Uh, today, if you hear the expression global governance or you're here uh, of um, cooperation, this is basically the principle of, um, of uh, voluntary cooperation among sovereign states. To establish real peace, we need <clears throat> a, a government, a government of peoples who can send representatives to an assembly where the laws can be enacted. Uh, and then they apply to individuals, not to states. We, we speak of um, the application of laws to individuals. The reason this is done, this is true for the United States. If you read the Federalist Papers of Hamilton, Madison, and Jay, this is, couldn't be clearer. <clears throat> the, well, the way Hamilton expressed it, why has government been established at all? because the passions of men will not submit to the dictates of reason and justice without constraint. The rule of law reaches individuals and they can be uh, constrained, punished even, by the police power of the state, not the military power. And individuals are weak compared to the society or a government of the whole people and uh, the wrongdoers can be fairly easily uh, apprehended and stopped um, under a government. Whereas under uh, a League of Sovereign States like the United Nations, what, what has the ultimate of power is a threat to wage war upon them, uh, to coerce the state. Uh, and that cannot be done without war. So, it's this notion that what we need to do is to establish the rule of law reaching to individuals that is the, uh, the main teaching of the Federalists. Um, it, we just lift it out of the experience of every national government. Uh, that's what governments do, what the United States government does. It, it's people are made citizens of the state and the state exists to protect their liberties. And their, and their security. How does it do that? It does this by 
the enactment of law that the people accept because they have consented to it by sending representatives to the legislature. And if they don't uh, agree to the, the rules of, the, of law, why um, the state is vested with power to apprehend them and bring them to a court where they, their wrongdoing can be proven by a rational process. And then finally, if they are found guilty, they can be punished, usually by prison terms. But this is very difficult to do at the world level. There's been some 30 historic federations to do this. The United States is one, so is Mexico, so is Brazil, so is Germany, so is Russia, so is India. But to do this at a world level is is um, a historical uh, difficulty. It's where things are changing fast. It is true. I have the hope from the processes of economic globalization. They are slowly knitting us together. But here we are in uh, 2022, and we have such a war uh, in Ukraine that um, it looks like this process of integration of the world preparatory to a federal to a legal a federal union is going to be set back, uh, I, I guess, for at least a century. So Gail, um, those six principles, they're worth pondering. They really are. They're so different from what passes as international organization. Um, we'll come back to them. What do you think? Any is that right? Do you agree with me? Yeah, you're still on mute. Yes, I think it's something that can uh, form the basis for um, a lot of in-depth discussion. Right. I think it's a historic. It's a historic challenge to us. Um, okay. Okay. Joseph, shall I go to the next question? Yeah, please. Okay, Byron, you're up. Hi, Joseph, thanks for everything you're doing here today and in this process of, of going through your incredible work. Um, I, I'm just curious about Emory Reeves. He's you know such an important figure as a thought leader. And um, I think you said he appeared at, in Dublin and gave a kind of excited speech. And then he, uh, it appears that he fades from this uh, story, at least uh, in these chapters that we read. So can you fill us in on what, what happened? You know, I mean, sometimes writers don't become activists, they're just writers. And, and is that the case with Emory Reeves or, or or what are we messing about? Or can you just fill us in about his later career? Well, Emery Reeves was a Hungarian journalist. And um, in the 30s, when Hitler was in power, uh, Reeves became a thorn in Hitler's side. He uh, it was very um, critical of the, the Nazi leader. He uh, was in Paris uh, during the German attack on France and uh, narrowly escaped. And then he wrote this book. His mother was uh, brutally killed. He was Jewish, kind of a small man. And Clark's um, wife, you know, it's strange. <laughs> she had anti-Jewish prejudices and it, it came out when I was doing this research on the Dublin conference. A little man, uh, very excited. The author of The Anatomy of Peace uh, still a stirring book. Um, it was indeed a, a, a book critical of the sovereign state system and not very helpful about the solution. He, he thought that perhaps uh, he had no great hopes for the United Nations. He thought that perhaps somehow uh, a world legally uh, order could be established, but he had little little to contribute to that, it's true. He was the sort of person who disappeared. I know later in life he 
became a great um, uh, art collector. And there was, um, I've forgotten now, there was a somewhere, there was an Emory Reeves uh, Center established in Virginia. And now I've forgotten the details about that. Um, I once uh, uh, wrote to them thinking that, well, maybe Reeves was a, a precursor to the World Federalist. And I was treated like just a complete jerk, you know. Huh. You're, yeah, so. Really? But you know, the anatomy of peace uh, was a kind of um, model. A letter, uh, Norman Cousins uh, describing his own uh, efforts to uh, use humor to, to deal with his cancer. He wrote a book called The Anatomy of an yeah. of an Illness. Of an Illness, an Anatomy of an Illness. And occasionally there are other books uh, with that. Wasn't that title. Norman Cousins? Norman Cousins, yeah. 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 The Anatomy of a, an Illness. Uh, his solution was uh, to watch funny movies uh, like, um, I suppose, um, Charlie Chaplin. Right. Mark's brother. Yeah. I'm afraid that Emery Reeves is um, a person, I mentioned a person who sort of, who uh, was part of that ferment of thought at the end of the Second World War, it was influential. I pretty much, uh, I have a little brief account at the beginning of this chapter, um, but he wasn't the person who uh, led the, who led the World Federalist Movement. That fell to Clark and Osborne. Okay, thanks. That's Punch helpful. Him. Yeah. So, I mean, he had a brief uh, 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 fame throughout the world, but then he, he just he was not going to become a leader. That was not that was not the kind of person he was. No, and I I, I think uh, with a little reflection, we can understand this. Uh, that poor man lived through the Hitler period and uh, was Jewish and uh, suffered the loss of his mother and uh, for all I know more of his family and there's only so much so much suffering you can take right uh, he wrote a powerful book uh, indicting the nation states for for letting that war happen um, the French and the English and the Versailles Treaty, but um, as far then you expect him to to go through another phase of his life and lead a movement to correct those injustices. Yeah. It's beyond human power. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's good that he didn't have to suffer through those disappointments <laughs> that came later. So thank thanks again for that account. Great. Thank you. I saw both Ron and Simon have their hands up. So let me get them. And then I put myself in the queue. So I'll go after them. So Ron, why don't you take it away? And then Simon. This is kind of a minor point, but I believe that the correct pronunciation of his name is Rebus rather than Reeves. I'm not sure of that. I'm not Hungarian, but I believe that, that Reeves is just an anglicized version of how it should be pronounced. I believe that it should be Revis. <laughs> or oh, Revish. I've heard Revish. Revish, yes. Do you know yes. how to, do you remember that uh, figure of, who led the Hungarians in 1956? And it looks like his name was, um, was, uh, uh, oh, fui. Um, oh. Oh, uh, oh, shoot. It'll come back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I can't pronounce Hungarian. I, 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 it's worse than Polish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, What's your question, Ron? Ron, you're back on mute. You put yourself back on mute. Oh, Emery Lund. The question, Emery the question is, Lund. what is the correct pronunciation yeah of the name of Emery, the last name. Is it Reeves or Revis? And I believe, Revis, I believe it has two syllables, Revis. I'm okay. not sure, okay. I don't know Hungarian. Great, so it, it sounds like we will not get the definitive answer in this session, but yes. it's good that it was raised. Okay, Ron, did you have a question on top of that or shall no. we go on? 
No. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Simon. Uh, thank you so much, Joseph, for being such a wonderful teacher. Uh, two questions. One is, what's your advice to the United Nations for it to be effective? Second question. We know that the European Union that you discussed works. How can that be expanded, expanded to become a global union? with the initiation of the European Union from within of 27 countries now, how to make it 195 countries plus six territories. So the first question is, how do you think the United Nations can become effective? And it's not been since its foundation. And second question, how do you visualize the European Union, which is effective and the only effective international body in the world's history to become gradually by educating the other countries uh, uh, to have the uh, laws and uh, uh, systems of government that the European Union has and help them join the European Union uh, for a global union. Thank okay. you. So, so Simon, as facilitator, I'm going to cut in and remind uh, everybody that Joseph asked first questions about the two chapters and then questions about current events, whether they're what to do with the UN now or the EU now. So I'm gonna hold that question and have that be the first question when we get, when we cleared the decks of all the questions about the two chapters. So, um, so, so yeah, so we'll start with you unless Joseph, you wanted to say something about that now. I, I happen to have a short answer. Oh, good. Okay. Simon, questions, and I'd like to come back to that. But um, Simon, thank you very much. Um, I'll tell you. Uh, the, I'll, I'll tell you a little story about Cord Meyer, the first president of United World Federalists. Uh, you must have heard that um, the Federalists were able to get uh, hearings in the uh, Congress of the United States uh, when uh, there were some sixteen uh, World Federalists bills before the Congress and um, um, even uh, Secretary of State George Marshall came to one of these uh, hearings uh, to oppose the World Federalists. And in the course of the, the discussions, Meyer was asked, well, if you could make only one change in the charter, what would it be to make it effective? And Meyer said, don't touch the veto. Make the General Assembly elective by the people. And as far as the e making the uh, EU expand, um, um, it uh, uh, there's well, we're getting into the Ukraine, but um, it's possible that NATO will uh, collapse. Uh, especially if uh, Russia tries to take over the Baltic states again. But the EU could uh, unite unconstitutionally and it could form a, a defensive um, collective security organization and bring in Russia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not going to um, pronounce on this ex cathedra um, but we're going to witness profound changes in very short order. Can we have another question, please? Uh, yes, I'm next in queue. Um, I have a quick comment and two questions. One is you mentioned young people and the need for young people. And my comment is just that people here would not know uh, that, that this week on Thursday, actually, um, the staff of Citizens of Global Solutions met with the leadership of the Young World Federalists who asked us to have a specific program for the youth uh, and for them, um, and also to help handle some of their organizational and administrative issues. So we are, we are moving ahead with that. We're looking at how to do that. So there is a, a growing um, cadre of younger people, and we want to do what we can to nurture that. So that's my comment. My two questions is you mentioned um, earlier, Joseph, that 
um, the organ, you know, our, our the predecessor of our organization was getting ready for these, you know, challenges that that we were communist or we were whatever. Um, and I I did find uh, when I was doing some research myself, I did find one of our you know our, our predecessor organization on some list of un-American activities, you know, along with other organizations that the government was going to go after. And I wonder if you if you know that or or, know, or or can give us more information about that. That's question one. Question two is from um, what happened uh, post uh, Clark and post Osborne. If there's any kind of lessons learned, if we were looking at what we could do, you know, what we can do based on missteps that they took. Um, so, um, so those are my, my two questions. Thank you. Um, I uh, have not distributed um, a chapter on uh, World Fiddlers in the Cold War. Uh, it's, um, it's a chapter, uh, it's chapter 25 before the conclusion. Um, the uh, world federalists were never uh, attacked by Joseph McCarthy, um, uh, but there were attacks um, on them for uh, lack of patriotism. Um, and I've, um, uh, the, the uh, attacks are described in this chapter that I, chapter 25, um, the real opponents of the world, United World Federalists were the Daughters of the American Revolution and the, uh, uh, and the uh, VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the oldest of the veterans groups, the VFW and the DAR. Um, and in fact, at the time that General MacArthur was relieved of command, you may know uh, by Truman, um, uh, MacArthur's uh, uh, attended a, a conference of the VFW, which was uh, designed to uh, strategize uh, to uh, destroy United World Federalists. Um, but uh, the, uh, the real scurrilous attacks uh, by Senator McCarthy did not come, although the Federalists were under Cranston were uh, preparing for them. Um, and, uh, and as far as the lessons learned from um, the Federalists, I'm going to have to uh, postpone that to the conclusion, which I did distribute. I think it's chapter 26. Um, I, draw, I draw lessons. Uh, I think briefly, we might say here that um, it was the movement was completely uh, overtaken by the national leaders, uh, Truman and Stalin, who never lost control of events and uh, pursued nationalist policies. Uh, there, there was no real, nobody listened to Emory Reeves um, or Rivas. Uh, there was, <laughs> the other Hungarian, his, his name looked like Emory Nudge, but it's, that's not how you pronounce it in Hungarian. So, um, so I'll leave, the, uh, but the, in short, um, <clears throat> uh, I would say that the ideas were not proven wrong, that uh, the, uh, everyone senses that the next fundamental step from the United Nations is a federal union. Um, the UN in principle is a confederation of states and uh, the United States under the constitution is a, is a government of people. Um, but, um, but the circumstances, the historical uh, circumstances uh, were uh, opposed. I think if, if Roosevelt had lived, you know, he died at 63, at the start of his fourth term, he might've been able to uh, accommodate Stalin's determination to establish friendly governments on his Western periphery the same issue that uh, is now animating Vladimir Putin uh, and um, 
perhaps we could have avoided that Cold War. And the alliance, the grand alliance of the democracies in World War II could have survived in some way. That would have made the veto almost irrelevant. If the great powers were united as they had been during the war, why, uh, we could have gone forward with uh, rebuilding the, uh, Europe after the war and uh, freeing the colonial peoples and uh, coming to grips with our deep uh, internal problems, particularly racism in the United States and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, dissidents in the Soviet Union. But all that, and then you see, Bob, everything has been forgotten. Yeah. It was such a defeat that these very principles enshrined in those, uh, in those six uh, of, of the Clark De Declaration, these principles have been, they're ideal, they're known. They're, I used to think none of this was ever, was not, was unknown to thoughtful people, and, but on the contrary, um, uh, there, the ideals are understood, even by people in the State Department, but um, it's just seen as unworkable. But if we don't uphold the ideal, I, f which is what I try to do, um, well, they will never, you'll never be operative. Okay, is there another question, please? Maybe it's yeah, time to yeah. move on to Ukraine. Yeah, well, I do see another hand, David Gallup. Is this still on history on the chapters or are we ready to transition on? Yeah, uh, well, it's uh, a question of a reply to Gail's question about Sarazak, but also a question for Professor Barada about his research. So it still relates to the, to the chapters, I guess. Okay, well, so we'll use your question as the transition, then we'll open it up again. I'll for, after you, I'll first go back to Simon uh, to because we put him partially on hold and so, then anything else about current events and the Ukraine. So go ahead, uh, David. Okay, so just to quickly reply to Gail about uh, Colonel Robert Sarazak. Yeah, he was a French resistance fighter uh, and uh, bandied together a group of, of French uh, uh, to resist uh, Germans, uh, the German you know, uh, intrusion into France. Uh, he was also really well known for uh, changing the name of the city Caor in, in the region of Lo in France to Caor Mundi. So it became what would be known as like the first, one of the first world cities or world citizen cities. Uh, but he was Gary Davis's, uh, the leader of Gary's Comité de Solidarité, the Committee of Solidarity, which was a group of uh, like uh, Albert Camus, him, uh, expatriate Americans and others who supported the Gary's renunciation of a citizenship and then creating a registry of world citizens in Paris. So yeah, he was very dramatic. So I get why Professor Barada, uh, you know, mentioned the, the word perhaps hysterics <laughs> in there. And that was to raise, you know, just like Gary, to raise a lot of awareness among the public to get the public's attention. I think that was, he was very good at, at that, Sarazak as well as Gary. Um, so, but now, now my question to Professor Barada, uh, I mean, listening to you talk and I, I sort of brought this up in our last book club meeting, uh, you know, I feel I feel your your frustration and and sort of being disgruntled about you know the the pace of movement in uh, of world federalists and all. Uh, and so I'm wondering though, it, was there did you feel in doing your research was there a limitation in the source material? That you had to go through. I mean, I, I, you know, I know, I know. In these books, there's a lot of source material that you had to go through to write these books. But was there a limitation? Did you feel as you were writing uh, that was sort of presented a negativity towards the World Federalist Movement? Negative comments in in uh, you know newspaper articles. Negative comments by congressional leaders. Negative comments even maybe by Edith Winner, who seemed to be one of your big. Uh, you know, for in her letters or something, you had a, you know found a lot of source material there. So. Did you feel that there was, in that source material, there was either a limitation on what you could say, you know, and, and still be truthful to what actually happened, I guess, is, is my question. Um, well, uh, David, 
I, I see you have a copy of my book um, that uh, warms my heart. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that there's a chapter on Gary Davis there and, and uh, Colonel Sarazak is prominently mentioned. Um, in fact, you might want to um, get back to me about that. I'm a uh, little, uh, that's quite a phenomenon. Now, um, yes, I see what you're driving at about uh, limitations in the source material. And when you mentioned that Edith Winner, I, I, I knew what you were talking about. <laughs> I can tell you, um, as you, uh, if you notice the footnotes, you'll see that uh, there are uh, archives all over the world are cited. Um, um, and I was always treated with the utmost courtesy by uh, research librarians wherever I went, except in the annex to the New York Public Library presided over by Edith Winner. And indeed, uh, she, uh, she began to dictate to me how I was to interpret this uh, movement. And in the end, uh, when she saw my uh, dissertation, which I confess had, um, <clears throat> was very amateurish still, uh, why um, she uh, almost, uh, she just uh, wiped her hands uh, to get rid of me. Um, I had to, in fact, she, she was instrumental in getting, getting me a small grant. And the trouble with doing research is that it's expensive. And even if you drive your own car um, and you live in the Y, um, and finally I got a $1,000 grant, which she arranged with one of the, with a feminist group. And um, then because um, I accepted this money, she felt she had the right to tell me how to interpret things. And I did not see uh, things her way. For instance, a lot of world federalists just don't know any Cold War history. They don't know the, what the containment policy is. And um, they just think that the, uh, the federalists were defeated by, by uh, crooks and uh, tyrants. And, and I just didn't see everybody uh, especially in the State Department and other national capitals um, as bad people. They were people who were trying as best they could to secure the peace. And they, things happened so fast after the atomic bomb was used that uh, uh, they fell back on old fashioned solutions of national, uh, national defense. Um, but I finally had to uh, tell Edith Winner that uh, I would not accept any more money uh, from her, uh, she was associated because of her um, uh, her her um, dictates to me as a, as a, as a scholar trying to find out the truth. Um, so, uh, in short, um, beware. <laughs> I tell you, I have to tell you one other thing. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't say this and I should prepare a state careful statement, but one of the problems with the World Federalist Movement is that some people who deeply understand what they were, what, what is proposed, yes, to establish a government of laws reaching to individuals. And Gary Davis was typical of those kinds of people. As, um, so was the court Meyer. Um, they become actually dangerous. Um, they become such cranks that um, uh, you have to get a, you have to steer clear of them. You know, I once interviewed Cord Meyer later in life. That man frightened me. Um, it was after his career in the CIA. Do you know he rose to the to the number three ranks in in uh, operations, and he used his knowledge of, of some of these uh, peace workers um, to subvert uh, the student movements in the Cold War. And um, beware, this is this is dangerous business. It really is. Some of our own 
have to be watched. Okay, let's go on, please. Okay, great. So at this point, we'll open it up to current events, including Ukraine. I'm going to go back first to Simon and then see if there's anybody else who has not yet spoken for the first time or asked the question for the first time. And then when we get to the second time, people, Tad is first in line. Um, so, um, J Joseph, do you want do you, do you need Simon to restate his question, or do you re recall what he asked? What 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 would be helpful to you? No, I I recall Simon's question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, his second question was about um, the expansion of the European Union. Um, I. I uh, I, I th think that I'm, well, I'm troubled that the world federalists are more interested in the European Union. And um, this is a, this is practical federalism. Um, I know, Bob, you, you're, you're thinking of having a, uh, a conference about uh, proposals and, and I, I suggested you do one on the, on the uh, Lisbon Treaty of the European Union. Um, this is a very interesting. And I mean, the real work of uniting sovereigns is taking place in Europe. And so uh, you'll see that it's very slow work. Uh, the coal and steel community deals dates from 1950. And uh, this is very slow work. Uh, and although uh, and states still uh, retain their individual powers of over uh, their budgets and foreign policy and uh, defense. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, so Simon, I, I don't want to speculate more than I've already done, but I do think, I, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, the leading journal of European federalism is called the Federalist Debate, produced, uh, edited by uh, Lucio Levi, a professor at the uh, University of Turin, Turin. And I've been uh, honored really to be uh, uh, invited some, to, to write some uh, articles for the Federalist Debate of Turin. And this month, the March issue was being produced and Levy was so troubled by rapidly moving events in Ukraine that he couldn't write his editorial, which appears in every issue. And he, so he took an article of mine that I had published in Responsible Statecraft back in December about avoiding a new Cold War with Russia, he put my article in the position of his editorial. And we went back and forth about this. And um, um, I thought my article was totally in, inappropriate and out of date and um, it, it would have to be radically re rewritten. I did so. And then some of Levy, Levy and, uh, and uh, colleagues, they inserted uh, language which actually contradicted what I had written. So the, the whole thing was just miserable. Uh, so bad. It was what? It was so bad. I said to him, um, uh, this is a um, wretched piece of work. I, I have an idea. Let's delete the whole thing and just put in a, uh, an explanation that Events have moved so fast in Ukraine that we could not produce our normal long-term uh, editorial from, a, from the point of view of European Federation. So we, we could not write, an, we, we were not producing an editorial in the March issue of the Federalist debate. There's a blank page and that should tell you something. We don't know. We don't know what's coming. Uh, Levy speaks in, in his uh, comment. He speaks of uh, of a uh, a new world order coming uh, arising out of the ashes of war in Europe. What 
I hate, I, you know, can the EU expand? Well, I'll tell you, I'll, yes, it could, but I don't know it, how far it could expand. But I might mention something else because you're listening to me and I want to tell you something about NATO, okay? NATO has expanded, it's true, and um, it's threatening this Russia, it's true, and so on. But you notice that the Americans do not think NATO expansion was threatening to Russia. It was, they can't understand this. Uh, Putin's two proposed treaties, one with NATO and one with the United States, were non-starters because NATO doesn't hurt, it doesn't threaten anybody. Biden's uh, press secretary, Yan, John, Yan, uh, John, Jen. Jen Saki. Saki. She said, Putin's fears are like a fox climbing up on the top of the chicken coop and, and uh, calling out for help because, the chick because of the danger of the chickens. You know, I, well, I'll tell you, there's a, there is something to that. Okay, please forgive me. Uh, I must be the devil's advocate here. In 1994, uh, when Yeltsin was managing the post-Soviet order, the United States established something called the Partnership for Peace. And this was designed to gradually uh, add more nations to NATO. President Clinton described it as um, the uh, as a welcoming of new states into NATO. Now, NATO is a collective security organization. The United Nations is a collective security organization. The way it keeps the peace is to uh, declare that an attack upon any one member shall be treated by the others as an attack upon all. And they will consult with one another to determine what measures, including military, they should take in response to this attack. Well, that creates such a threat uh, of collective military response that no aggressor would really dare to make the initial attack. And NATO has been quite successful in Europe. If you notice, peace in Europe has been pretty good since 1945, since 49, you know? And the hope was that the collective security could be expanded to a world, to the world level at the United, in the United Nations. So what NATO really offers is, is um, uh, security to its members. And the Partnership for Peace grew to 41 states, including Russia, and all the former republics of the Soviet Union. That should have been, if that was properly managed, that should have been the mechanism by which NATO expanded, even to include Russia in a mutually beneficial collective security order. The problem was that it was mismanaged. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, President H.W. Bush in his State of the Union address in 1992, he declared that we won the Cold War, they lost. And we went through this period of US triumphalism. I think if you will remember you know, that's what led us to this to the attack upon Iraq in 2003. We were going to spread democracy all over the world. The partnership for peace became a dead letter by the expansion of NATO uh, and the last accession of states, including Poland and the three Baltic republics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in 2004. The next states to be added to NATO were Ukraine and uh, Georgia, right? In 2008, and at that point, Vladimir Putin was strong enough 
to be to, to, to try to to uh, arrest this growth of what was very obviously, despite legal appearances, an, an anti-Russian organization. His, he took Crimea in, in 2014, and he compares it to the West NATO's taking of Kosovo in 1999. You know, just do you remember how we acted when when Khrushchev planted missiles in Cuba? You think we just said, oh, well, you know, missiles, uh, we have them in Italy. Uh, oh, tit for tat, we can live with that. No, we didn't. We all but waged war against Cuba if we could, to get those damn missiles out of there. I was in the Marine Corps at the time. I'm telling you, we were ready to go. So I'm terribly uh, frightened, really, um, about current events. I um, I find that the news. I'm just ashamed of the way that this is handled in the news. The whole thing, that everything is done to cultivate hatred for Putin and for and for Russia. You know, and every 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 accident, every maternity hospital struck and three people killed is elevated to a, a proof of how vicious and uh, <clears throat> this enemy is. The, the whole thing is treated like a spectator sport. You know, oh, aren't we proud? We sent uh, Javelin anti-tank missiles in large numbers to Ukraine. Uh, we sent Stinger anti-aircraft uh, uh, sh shoulder-fired uh, weapons to Ukraine. Well, what are those weapons going to do? They're going to kill Russians. And the New York Times prints on the front page a photograph of a dead Russian in the snow, aren't we happy? Look, this is how wars start. Okay, could I, 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 I would like to quote something to you, all right, please. One, rational voice I have seen in the press is an op-ed piece by Thomas L. Friedman in the New York Times on February 22nd. He remembered that in 1998, immediately after the Senate ratified NATO expansion, he called George Kennan, then 93 years old, to ask him what he thought of NATO expansion. And Kennan said this, I would like to quote this, please. Kennan said, I think it is the beginning of a new Cold War. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anybody else. This expansion would make the founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. Don't people understand? Our differences in the Cold War were with the Soviet communist regime. And now we're turning our backs on the very people who mounted the greatest bloodless revolution in history to remove that Soviet regime. And Russia's democracy is as far advanced, if not farther, as any of these countries we've just signed up to defend them against Russia. Of course, there's going to be a bad reaction from Russia. And then the NATO expanders will say that we always told you that is how the Russians are. But this is just wrong. I'd like to quote one more thing. Now, when you read the press, it's a little style 
always get to the last paragraph, okay? Because the, the earlier part, the part that the journalists think only people will, people will only read is all this <clears throat> boilerplate about hatred for the enemy. But at the end, there's often a very, almost a funny little corrective. Well, there was a story about Fox News. And um, uh, Sean Hanafi, I don't watch Fox News, but uh, <laughs> thank goodness the New York Times helped me out with a little account of this. Uh, Sean Hennessy had been saying that, well, this war is looming up, it's all Biden's doing. Um, um, he's getting us into, into war. Um, well, Fox News has a, a, a national security correspondent by the name of Jennifer Griffin. And Griffin um, uh, corrected Sean and said to him, Sean, how we got to this point is a long story and it predates the Biden administration. It includes mistakes made by every US president since the Soviet Union fell apart. That's true. Um, okay. okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, uh, Joseph, I'm gonna need to check with you again on time. We're about near the end of our official time. We have three people in the queue to speak a second time. I haven't yet checked to see if everyone who wants to speak the first time has. So my question to you is, do we need to wrap up at the agreed upon time or do you have more time to, uh, to devote to this? Uh, I can outlast you. I'm here as long <laughs> as you'll have me. Okay, terrific. And that, thank you. That, that, well, I'll take that as a challenge. So, um, so anyway, so let me first check. We have Tad, Simon and Ron in the queue for a second time. Uh, first, is there anyone who hasn't spoken for the first time who wants to? I see Virginia's hand up. Go ahead, Virginia. Joseph, um, you have told me uh, before, um, a few years back, how world federalism got a bad name at the UN. And I was wondering if you could expound on that. I know it's not directly related to Ukraine, but it it is in many ways because of the veto that Russia, uh, the Russian Security Council president um, made on the, on the resolution to censure Russia. Could you speak to that? Uh, why the, the people like uh, Tom Weiss and others who badmouth world federalism, why did that, why was it given a bad name in, from the beginning? Uh, well, um, let me go, just go back to the beginning. Um, you may, uh, no, I've just uh, uh, recounted the formation of in the World Federalist Movement by Henry Osborne. And of course, this was a movement very critical of the United Nations. As a League of Sovereign States, it could never keep the peace. What we needed to do was to abandon it and, uh, and, and inaugurate a, a federal government of the world. Um, naturally, uh, that didn't um, wasn't very friendly to the United Nations, and so um, the United World Federalists were not admitted as a non-governmental organization until 1951. Um, uh, and uh, at that point, uh, WFM had softened its line quite a bit. And all they offered was to cooperate with the United Nations, with the other NGOs, and um, do what they could to um, um, make world peace at the very beginning of the Cold War. So um, the bad mouthing of the uh, was uh, of the of the UN uh, tended to cause uh, others to uh, reject federalists everywhere. Could we uh, have another question, please? 
sure. Anyone else who has not spoken yet wants to ask a question now? If not, I'll go to the second timers. Going once, going twice. Okay, terrific. Uh, again, I want to remind all the second timers, please be brief. We're in overtime, as they would say in football. So uh, we have Ted, <laughs> then Simon, then Ron. Go ahead, Ted. Professor, the reason I uh, raised my hand a second time is because it, to ask a history question, uh, I was stimulated by something you said. Uh, but first, I just want to really applaud uh, your remarks uh, about uh, Ukraine and NATO. Uh, I completely agree with them. Uh, both Robert Wright and Peter Beinart have been writing much like Tom Friedman. And I myself on Twitter have been trying for the past month to make the point that it is possible both to condemn the illegal aggression, to condemn Putin's despotism, but at the same time acknowledge that NATO expansion, of course, has, for 30 years, has generated a profound threat to Russian national security. And I too am outraged that often when one makes this point, one is accused of uttering a Russian talking point. So thank you for your eloquent uh, defense of that. Uh, uh, that thesis, which I embrace. Now my history question, which is, uh, I was intrigued when you said, geez, if Roosevelt had lived, things might have gone very differently. And that reminds me of a question that I've never really gotten a good answer to, which is why did Harry Truman really in the end do so little um, about um, our uh, world federalist uh, agenda Given that, as you well know, because I know this uh, largely from reading your two books, um, he embraced, um, he was very familiar with the notion of uh, World Federation. Um, he gave that speech in Kansas City two days after signing the UN Charter, where he talked about a republic of the world. And then at Yalta, again, I'm taking this from uh, your book, three weeks later, a reporter asked him about that. And he pulls out his wallet and pulls out a handwritten copy of Tennyson's poem, hear the war drum throb no longer, let the battle flags all, see the battle flags all furled in the parliament of man, the federation of the world. And he said he had written that poem by hand and carried it in his wallet since uh, he was in high school, which is an astonishing thing. And, and so I, sorry, Bob, I was more long-winded than I intended to be. I'm delighted to know that about President Truman, but also perplexed that in the end, he didn't do much to advance uh, the human race toward the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. Thank you. Uh, well, Tad, this is an example of how persons in high places are quite aware of the, uh, of the uh, alternative of a Federation of the World. Uh, uh, um, also, um, uh, John Foster Dulles, who was a contemporary of Grenville Clark uh, and even a, a fellow uh, colleague, um, had uh, during the war uh, made eloquent. Uh, he, he was a, a leader in the Presbyterian Church, and he he made a very eloquent uh, proposals in 1943. Um, for world peace. Um, and yet when he came to power in the Eisenhower administration, why he uh, chucked all that out the window. Yeah, that, uh, that t quote by Tennyson uh, is wonderful. Have you ever read the whole poem, Laxley Hall? Well, it's something to do. Um, could we have, uh, Simon has another question? Sure, Simon and then Ron. Go ahead, Simon. Uh, thank you again, uh, Joseph. Uh, what we've been discussing mainly is theory. What we need is action and practice besides theory. Is that right? Now, the again, the only action that has been successful is the European Union. It's a supranational laws, and there are laws and economic conditions that have to be fulfilled by each country to become a member. And when they fulfill that with education getting from the union members, which were six at the beginning, 
then they are incorporated. So they became 28, Brexit, United Kingdom, uh, left. It's a confederation. It's a confederation. It's a, you know, a, a, a practical step to federation. But we have perhaps to go through this in a practical way uh, to fulfill the theories of a federation. And now, I think if, don't you think if the European Union is given that authority by the people, as we mentioned, the, who are important and the people are the, are the people in the European Union people besides anybody else like ourselves interested in a world confederation or federation, we should encourage the European Union with funds and with uh, uh, active negotiations with uh, uh, countries beginning from uh, the countries surrounding the European Union and moving on to the other continents of Asia and uh, Australia and America, South America, in order to become a world confederation uh, with supranational laws, obeying the laws that are practically working in the European Union uh, to become a world confederation, a global confederation, and then a federation like we are. What do you think, Joseph? Well, Simon, you are, <laughs> you're so right. And uh, everything you say is so full of implications. Um, I do think that the European Union deserves much more attention from us. And uh, we should look forward to its uh, further evolution. I was very, very disappointed that the constitution, uh, the draft constitution of Valerie Giscard d'Estaing um, failed in 2005, I think it was. Um, and uh, it's possible uh, what they've done is um, uh, uni further united on a treaty basis which in your terms is um, confederal um, rather than federal. Um, and so the, and the, Euro, uh, the European Union uh, is, uh, shows us how things may develop quite contrary to simple theory. Um, it, uh, it's just partly supranational, but also it retains national features, particularly in the Council of Ministers. Uh, however, the uh, European Parliament was made directly electable by the people in 1979, and this immediately um, gave democratic legitimacy to the Parliament and um, slowly, much too slowly, but slowly it's um, acquiring more powers of law. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to make a couple of comments uh, here. Um, one one uh, fact about international relations that troubles me is that although the EU and NATO have um, begun the process of uh, uh, developing the uh, a working uh, federal government in Europe, there's no such process in Asia. There's no NATO in Asia. There's CETO, you may know, and ASEAN, but um, Asia is particularly unorganized. I think it's because of the heritage of Japanese imperialism and the Chinese and the Japanese are just never gonna cooperate or at least I mean, it doesn't look like they will, but they ought to. Um, and so uh, Asia strikes me as particularly uh, dangerous. And lastly, I'd like to say something, you use the word norm and I'm, uh, if you read anything about the, uh, by uh, scholars of uh, the United Nations and uh, uh, take uh, or, or about uh, global governance. Uh, Thomas G. Weiss is typical of these people. Of why uh, they use the word norm quite a bit, and I've been puzzled by this because um, the word norm does not appear in the charter. And what is a norm? And um, well, it comes from the Latin norma, which means rule. And scholars have no have noted have you learned 
I use this term quite frequently, not to describe actual uh, constitutional principles that you can find in the charter, but as the working rules of the of the charter. And I think I've said this once before, the first rule, the first norm is national sovereignty, oddly enough, in Article 2.1. And then the second norm is non-aggression in Article 2, 3, and 4. And uh, the third is uh, the performance of treaties in Article uh, 2, uh, uh, 2 and uh, several other places. So there are, what, are, what scholars see happening is that the, um, in fact, I once made a list, and if you like, I can send it to you. I mean, there are, I, mean, I checked all, uh, I must made a list of all the norms that scholars claim are at work, and it came to about two dozen. These are the, um, the working world laws, the unwritten norms of international relations. It's fragile. It's very fragile, but they are there. And you, one way things might develop is that without any actual constitution drafting, the norms of peaceful relations, particularly non-aggression and performance of treaties and human rights and rights of women, the rights of labor, these are norms too. Uh, the, uh, these norms might uh, gradually re remake the world, even though the institutions are very primitive. That's all. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Our last question in the queue is from Ron Glossop. Then we'll get to our announcements. I don't really want to ask a question. I want to make a couple of comments. First of all, I want to congratulate Joe Barada. He has done such a fantastic job of giving us information. His knowledge and insights are just fantastic. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Joe, for a wonderful presentation for us. Pardon me, Ron, but uh, since we're dealing with pronunciation of names, I go by Joseph. <laughs> Joseph. Okay, <laughs> Joseph. Um, yeah, Joseph. Well, um, I do want to make a couple of comments about how the issues that we're dealing with are actually very complex. We're dealing with nationalism on the one hand versus globalism. We are dealing with capitalism and democracy, which are two parts of ideology in the United States, but they don't always go together very well, as we can see within our own national borders. So I think we have to recognize that the issues are complex and especially that the movement from a confederation to a federation is not easy. It's a wonder that our federalists brought it about in this country and it will be even more difficult on the global level, but it's not impossible. And I think we're moving in the right direction I think we have to recognize our differences within Russia too. There's a big difference between the people who supported Gorbachev and the people who are supporting Putin, which are not very many. So there's a big difference of what viewpoints are within Russia. Great, thank, thank you, you, Ron. Um, Joseph, anything that you wanna to say to wrap up for yourself and then I'll make a few announcements and open it up if people have any things they wanted to promote. Well, I, I would just like to say uh, in response to Ron Glossop, um, um, there, uh, there are precedents for what we aim to do. And you should bear in mind there have been, since the formation of the United States of America and its constitution of 1787, um, there have been some 30 national federations that have formed. And they're out there uh, very successful. Some of them have, are, have been spectacular failures, particularly the Soviet Union, but uh, India is in principle a federation and even China has autonomous area, areas. Um, uh, another, another fact that I think is relevant besides the national federations are the, the 
are the clauses in national constitutions providing for delegations of sovereign powers to a, a, a union. Uh, I, in the back of my book, I have uh, some 27 of these cited. Uh, every state that's joined the European Union has, uh, has a, a clause providing for um, delegation of sovereign powers. So it is not, it is not really that far-fetched to talk about limitations of sovereignty um, many constitutions actually provide for this. It's um, uh, in the for the formation of a more perfect and higher union. My problem is, <clears throat> I don't know where you should go from here, Bob. Uh, do you mean I in this know. meeting, or do you mean in our in our organization's activities? In your organization's activities. Oh well, that that's what I want to meet with you about and show you what our plans are. <laughs> okay. C consult with you about that. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me. I look forward to uh, other meetings. Okay. Well, before I switch to announcements again, I want to say on behalf of the group, um, thank you so so much. Uh, as I mentioned to you before the session started, that that you and your book. Um, and these sessions have been the only ones that we have gone over each and every time. Uh, so the level of engagement and the richness of what you're bringing us um, really is unsurpassed. So thank you so, so much. Um, so with that, I will transition over to see if there are any final announcements that people, if people are promoting things, events or whatever, and also invite Gail to jump in and let us know when the next session will be. So are there any, um, and, oh, yes. Okay, Virginia, I see your hand. The Institute for Global Leadership is supporting a bill and a bipartisan bill in the House of Representatives called the, um, it's called the uh, HR 6843 Building Civic Bridges Act. It's a bipartisan effort. There are, there's a group that's uh, putting on something called National Conversations Week for America. We'll be having four events with other partners to support that bill to build civic bridges. And I wanted to know if I could send you those dates. Well, you, you're welcome to put it in the link. We, we, we try to protect the, um, you know, the email overload of people so we don't forward things from folks announcing. Uh, but if you put it in the, in the chat, um, then everybody will have the link and can go to that. I don't have any way to do that. Okay, so um, so if you send it's, it's it, to, a, if, if, if you, you send it to Gail, then okay. we can include something in our next announcement. If it, it, long ago, we one of our norms is that if we have a number of people wanting to announce things, it floods people with email. So we had an early discussion about that and decided not to do that. Oh. We try to protect the participants. So send oh, it to course. Gail, and that could be included in our next announcement to minimize the amount of email that people get. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Byron, announcements? Byron, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, in line with what Joseph said about timing and uh, seizing the hour, so to speak, which the early world federalists did not really do. I think that's that's something that it relates to our work right now, in particular about Ukraine. And everybody should know, a lot of folks here know, but some many don't, that we're trying to do an initiative around the ICC, ICC ratification. So staff is working on various facets of this that the US ought to ratify the ICC because the US is trying to call Russia to account under uh, uh, under the ICC uh, under the ICC, so we need to seize this, and I propose that we get one or two or three people in Congress to publicly, you know, back our proposal for ICC ratification by the United States. But we have a lot of facets to this, so keep an eye out for what we're going to be doing, and and uh, and contribute ideas about what to do or how to do this. Because after the after the trauma of this war fades, then then the time we, we may lose the, the the opportunity to promote this to the public to the general public, the United States. 
or at least to our our our, our base audience. So thanks. Good. Thank you. And and piggybacking on that, I'll just make the announcement that if you have any suggestions either about that, about the book club, or anything else with Citizens for Global Solutions, you should send those to outreach at globalsolutions.org. Again, our email is outreach at globalsolutions.org. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements of events or other activities? If not, Gail, I'll ask you to let us know when the next meeting is. Right, so it's the second Saturday of April, which fits the pattern, the second Saturday of each month. And the same time from noon to 1.30 Eastern time, we're going to be focusing on chapter 17, which is 31 pages long, pages 349 to 376. And um, Joseph has um, sent, sent, that's among the chapters that Joseph has sent us. So I'll um, attach that to my next email so that you're able to bring it up and read it that way at your convenience. It's on Cord Meyer. Mainstream World Federalism is the title of the chapter. He um, apparently was um, proponent of UN reform is the way that he wanted to uh, proceed. And I have a particular interest in him because uh, he, um, you know, when I learned that he had been with World Federalism, um, he was the director of the CIA actually, wasn't he? And I, I'm curious about the rela if it was when he was direct and what that relationship was. Anyway, it's a particularly intriguing chapter for me and I hope it will be for you. Okay. Thank you, Gail. Other events to promote, uh, Tad? Thank you, Bob. I just wanted to uh, share with everyone here that I had a 20 minute uh, telephone conversation with Lucy Webster uh, about a week ago. And um, she sends her greetings to everyone. I was hoping she might join today. I've been in touch with her son, Daniel. Lucy is aging, um, but Daniel is out there visiting in New York right now, uh, but apparently they weren't able to pull it off. But uh, especially to you, Joseph, you know, Lucy and I talked about you and about uh, your book club. And she, like you, uh, is enduringly carrying the torch forward. So I just wanted to report that Lucy is alive and well and sends her greetings and love. Uh, to everyone and her continued admiration to you, Professor Barata. Great. Thank you, Ted. Any other announcements? Going once, going twice, then I'll make the final one, which is I want to remind people, if you have not renewed your membership, please do so. You met today two of our staff members. Believe it or not, we pay them. Uh, the money has to come from somewhere. Um, so we are trying to raise funds so that we could extend our reach and our voice and get this message out there. So thank you all for coming and we will see you next month. And Gail, if you wanna stay on, I'll stay on with you for a few minutes. Okay, um, yeah. All right, let's let everybody leave. <laughs> okay. But, oh. And Joseph, Evan, did you, you wanna say on? a few words? <laughs> oh, Joseph left, okay, great. Do you wanna want turn off recording? But... Oh yes, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. I wrote it down and I didn't look at my writing. Okay, <laughs> out of there. Okay.